Good afternoon. My name is Tom Nastic. I'm senior public program producer at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater today for the lecture Stars, of Fre Stars for Freedom, Hollywood, Black Celebrities, and the Civil Rights Movement by Emily Raymond. And a special welcome to those of you watching on our YouTube channel. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you about a few upcoming programs here at the National Archives. On Thursday, June 25th at 7 p.m., American University Professor Leonard Steinhorn will moderate a discussion program, D.C. Statehood and Representative Democracy. Panelists include Eleanor Holmes Norton, delegate to the U.S. Congress representing the District of Columbia, Anthony Williams, former mayor of the District of Columbia, and former members of Congress Jim Moran and Jim Walsh. This program is presented in partnership with the U.S. Association of the Former Members of Congress. And on Thursday, July 9th at noon, uh, historian Anthony S. Pitch makes a return visit to the National Archives to discuss his new book, Our Crime Was Being Jewish, Hundreds of Holocaust Survivors Tell Their Stories, and a book signing will follow that program. To find out more about these and all of our programs and exhibits, please consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies out in the lobby, and it's also available on our website at www.archives.gov. Our speaker today, Emily Raymond, is Associate Professor of History at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Professor Raymond specializes in 20th century American politics and culture. Her work focuses on the intersection between Hollywood and politics, as well as the influence of the civil rights movement, women's activism, and conservatism in American life. In addition to Stars for Freedom, she's the author of From My Cold Dead Hands, Charlton Heston and American Politics, and Hollywood and Politics, a source book, co-edited with Donald T. Critchlow. She is also the director of the annual VCU Southern Film Festival. Would you please welcome Emily Raymond to the National Archives. Hello. Thank you so much for coming out. It's wonderful to be at the National Archives. When I first started this project, the National Archives is where I started my research out at College Park, especially with the media and sound division. Um, and the cover of the book actually comes from the National Archives collection. So I'm grateful to be able to return now that the book is out. And one item from the National Archive collection is the Hollywood Roundtable. And we're going to show a short clip of this roundtable so just to set it up for you, um, this, this program appeared on CBS television the night of the March on Washington, so right after it had, it had happened. And it was moderated by the journalist David Schoenbrunn, and it featured six panelists who had been involved in the march. The writer, James Baldwin, the singer and actor, Harry Belafonte, the actor, Marlon Brando, sometimes singer Marlon Brando, I guess, if you've seen Guys and Dolls. Uh, the actor Charlton Heston, the actor Sidney Poitier, and the writer-director Joseph L. Mankiewicz. Best, he was best known for his 1950 film, All About Eve. And they had this unrehearsed discussion in which the group talked about their previous involvement with the, the civil rights movement, the significance of the March on Washington, and the future of civil rights in America. And this particular clip that we're watching features Poitier and Belafonte specifically, in which they discuss their need to be involved, what was really driving them to be involved. Thirteen years, he comes home a man of 32. And they started telling me I couldn't talk to him. In a television studio in Washington and, uh, on August 28, 1963, a small group from Hollywood, California, joined to give their own personally held views of the civil rights gathering which took place on that day. Never once did you give him Here, as citizens committed to the cause of civil rights, are <laughs> James Baldwin. And yet, I had to do something very difficult to Harry Belafonte, 
He's intelligent and articulate, but he's Marlon Brando. Turned up. Yeah. And the problem I Charlton had Heston. Had human sympathy, mm. but I had to be a relentless. Joseph Mankiewicz. Get his story, and to be sympathetically and play yeah. out. And Sidney Poitier. I felt this sense of urgency myself, Mr. Poitier, and I noticed today, all day long, in all of the speeches and all of the placards, I saw the word or heard the word now, 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 repeated with insistency. Was it for you a case of urgency and now, or has this been something that you've been fighting for a long time? Well, the nature of my life over the last 36 years has been such that uh, an urgency, uh, the urgency that was evident today, has been bubbling in me, personally, for most of these years, at least most of the years I came into adulthood. Uh, I became interested in the civil rights struggle out of a necessity to survive. And I think my interest <coughs> started uh, many years ago, never as intensely, however, as it exists today. How about a personal participation, such as today's extraordinary participation? Is this a, a rare experience for you? No, it is not a rare experience for me. Uh, I found, ha having lived in New York and in other parts of uh, America uh, over the last 20 years, since I came from the Caribbean, I found it necessary for self-protection and for, uh, to perpetuate my survival that I involve myself in any uh, activity that would ease my burden momentarily. Mr. Belafonte, many of us have felt, I particularly as a reporter around the world, I've seen things happen in certain countries at a given moment where what the French call a prise de conscience takes place, a sudden awareness of the problem. Now, I know in your case this hasn't been sudden. You've been very active in the civil rights movement, have you not? Yes, I have. Could you tell us a bit about your own role in civil rights? Well, civil rights are something that uh I inherited, or at least a struggle for civil rights. I got it from my mother and my father, and they got it from their mother and their fathers. And uh, to be in Washington today was for me an accumulation of a number of generations of black Americans who have been trying to appeal to the conscience of white supremacy and a superior force that has denied and disenfranchised the Negro for so long. And that to be in Washington was for me today a, a beginning, really, a kind of a climax to generations of hope. And uh, having been deeply immersed in the civil rights struggle and having been at the beginning of so many important civil rights issues in this country and demonstrations, it was indeed a, 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 a very powerful moment to see two things hundred thousand people, mostly black people, but uh, also white people, and to know that a nation such as America, and the reason that I struggle with it so hard and I grapple with it so hard is because I really believe in the potential of this country. And this country has not realized its potential. It has not even begun to scratch its surface in the humanities. And uh, uh, because I do feel strongly about that potential and because of the kind of inheritance, uh, inheritance I've had, uh, it was necessary for me to be there today. So this discussion went on for about 30 minutes altogether. And I wanted to show it because I think that it helps feature some of the most important Hollywood celebrities involved in the civil rights movement. And it also helps illustrate some of the qualities that they brought to the civil rights movement um, in, the, in the sense that they were able to attract media attention. They also had a familiarity with mainstream Americans and mainstream Americans were necessary to the success of the movement. And they also had the ability to articulate the civil rights message in a really constructive way. And that clip really helps us see that with Poitier and Belafonte t talking about uh, the need for self-protection in so many ways. Uh, this clip also provides a nice segue for my overall argument in the, in the book, which is that a small group of Hollywood stars and especially black celebrities significantly assisted the civil rights movement by acting as spokespersons, as fundraisers, as strategists, and as cheerleaders for movement organizations and activists. 
And they did this by using their public images, their show business and political connections, and their personal wealth for the movement's gain. So in terms of who these people were, those involved, um, I've kind of divided it up into two. The leading six, who were the six activists most consistently involved from the earliest point and who made the biggest impact. And then the Stars for Freedom sort of overall. So the leading six are Belafonte, who we just saw, also Ossie Davis and Ruby D. And they always sort of come together because they were such a partnership as a couple. Uh, the entertainer, Sammy Davis Jr., Poitier, and the comedian, Dick Gregory. And like I said, those were the ones who mo were most consistently involved in the movement. Other important figures included Dorothy Dandridge, Lena Horne, Burt Lancaster, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Theodore Bickell, who was a folk singer and actor, Frank Sinatra, Charlton Heston, Diane Carroll, and several others. And some of them are pictured here. This is a picture from the March on Washington with Heston and Belafonte leading the way with Belafonte's wife right next to him. And then James Garner and Diane Carroll and Paul Newman, Marlon Brando's back there. Um, so these are sort of collectively these stars for freedom. Now there's two really fascinating complications to the story in terms of the historical context. Two things are sort of complicating the ability for a Stars for Freedom to even exist. And one of those is the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, as it was better known. It's investigations of Hollywood in the 1940s. They were looking for communists and throughout those investigations, these investigations led to the blacklist, which was a studio, sort of studio, collective studio blacklist where the studios agreed not to hire anyone with communist ties. So the HUAC investigations and the blacklist had driven many film performers out of controversial social activism. And the civil rights movement certainly was a controversial movement in part because of the goals of the movement, racial integration and equality, uh, but also because it was the middle of the Cold War or the beginning of the Cold War and the Communist Party was a champion of racial equality. So both of those things were making it controversial. And a number of famous African American performers were blacklisted very early on. <clears throat> One of the most important was Paul Robeson, who was a consummate um, artist, and he was also a close friend and mentor to Poitier, Belafonte, Davis, and Dee. So him being blacklisted was really devastating for them to see their friend and their mentor kind of driven out of show business and not being able to make a, a livelihood as an artist. Um, other blacklisted performers included Canada Lee, who was a successful char character actor in the 1940s, and Hazel Scott. She was the first black woman to have her own television show way before Oprah in the 1950s. But she was blacklisted because she had spoken out against HUAC. So while Poitier, Belafonte, Davis, and Dee were openly critical of the blacklist, they also tried to follow Robeson's advice. Robeson had told them not to appear too radical, to try to distance themselves from some of the Communist Party's activities as a way to sort of self-protect their careers, but also as a way to still be effective civil rights activists, because Robeson was no longer an effective activist after he was blacklisted either. Um, the other complication to this story was that prior to World War II, African American actors had typically portrayed stereotypical and demeaning characters in Hollywood films. The studios were white-owned studios and they perpetuated commonly held assumptions about African Americans in the characters that were in the films. And beyond that, they did not employ any black directors, producers, screenwriters, or even any technical employees to tell them otherwise. The only jobs for African Americans in the film industry were in acting, and those roles available were usually in servile, 
positions and often for the purpose of comic relief through exaggerated dialect or exaggerated mannerisms or just outright silliness. Um, two of the most successful black actors in Hollywood prior to the 1950s were Hattie McDaniel and Lincoln Perry, pictured at the bottom. Lincoln Perry was better known by his stage name, Step and Fetch It. And Hattie McDaniel almost always played a mammy in Hollywood films. And her most famous mammy role was in Gone with the Wind, which is what's pictured here. And she won an Academy Award for this portrayal. And she is very no-nonsense and tough and smart. But at the same time, her entire identity is about serving whites. Um, Lincoln Perry, he was a very gifted comic, but a lot of his comedic roles, he appeared very foolish or very silly um, and used backward dialect in some of those roles. So neither Hattie McDaniel or Lincoln Perry, despite their success, were really considered to be proper spokespersons by groups like the NAACP um, in terms of sort of aligning celebrities with civil rights organizations to promote the movement itself. They felt like they weren't proper spokespersons because they weren't emitting the kind of image they wanted in, in their films. Um, and in fact, when the NAACP in the late 40s began pressuring Hollywood studios to improve, improve roles for African American actors, um, it actually led to sort of some fracturing between the black working actors in Hollywood and the NAACP. This um, newspaper, head, this is all part of one newspaper headline. Um, this sort of illustrates that tension. Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP, had come to Hollywood, was pressuring the studios to stop perpetuating stereotypes, as that main headline across um, suggests. But a number of black stars felt like he was interfering. He was not allowing them to choose their own roles. So there was tension between working actors and the NAACP. So there wasn't really a celebrity alignment um, prior to the 1950s. So we have these complications, given that we have some of these constraints. And given these constraints, how could Hollywood celebrities, and especially African American actors, take part in an incredibly controversial social movement during the Cold War era, and one that argued for the equal citizenship of black Americans when Hollywood itself was discriminatory? And so we have all of these things happening that are sort of constraining. But there's two Hollywood industrial changes that altered the context for black performers after World War II. Um, one was the breakdown of the studio system. In Hollywood's heyday of the 1920s and the 1930s, eight major studios basically controlled the entire film industry. They had an oligopoly where they controlled production, distribution, and exhibition. But two court cases um, sort of altered that. One, the California Supreme Court ruled against long-term player contracts, meaning actors would not have to be signed into a, um, a lockdown contract for more than seven years. Prior to that, the studios, they could own an actor basically for seven years and make them play any role the studio wanted or send them out to other studios to play whatever roles that studio wanted. Um, but the California Supreme Court ruled against that so after that, actors were allowed to become independent agents, like free agents in, in baseball terminology. Um, another major court case is known as the Paramount decision. And in this, the US Supreme Court argued that the studios did have an oligopoly. They were ordered to sell their theater chains. And they, the court also outlawed practices that had resulted in the studio control of distribution. So the Paramount decision basically made way for the rise of independent filmmakers who proved themselves much more willing to make films that the major studios had considered too controversial. 
Such films included message movies with liberal racial themes, often promoting integration, and often films that allowed African-American actors to play roles of professional characters, leading roles in which they felt like they portrayed a much more positive image. Uh, one great example is the film No Way Out, and this is Sidney Poitier's. This is kind of the film that defined his career. He plays a professional, he plays a doctor, but he's confronted with these series of ethical questions when he's forced to attend to white racist patients. And it shows him confronting racism and really defined his career. And these kinds of movies open up doors for other African American actors well, as well. But the caveat is that they were also, they were independent pictures. They were small pictures with shoestring budgets, and they also had limited theatrical runs. Um, another big change in terms of the industry was the advent of television. Television really changed Hollywood dramatically in the late 1940s, and it became increasingly popular throughout the 1950s. This also provided new opportunities for black actors and black entertainers. A lot of the network programs, the sitcoms, continued to perpetuate racial stereotypes, but the television variety show was extremely popular in the 1950s. And there are a number that were hosted by people like Eddie Cantor, pictured there on the left, or Steve Allen on the right. And they invited black performers on their shows. And what's different about these than, say, the sitcoms is that the black performers were able to come on and be themselves to interact comfortably in interracial settings. And this is largely how mainstream Americans would come to be familiar with people like Sammy Davis Jr. and a little bit later, the comedian Dick Gregory. So these kinds of opportunities were, were new, and Davis in particular was able to take advantage of them. So these developments, the message movies and television, allowed for black actors to develop public personas more in line with the civil rights movement, especially as it grew more urgent in the mid-1950s with the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which called for the integration of public schools, and with the Montgomery bus boycott, which launched Martin Luther King and his tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience into national prominence. However, only Poitier was able to make a living as a film and television actor. The rest of the leading six all supplemented their incomes through different artistic means, including recording contracts, nightclub contracts, and Broadway productions. And this is because of the ongoing limitations in Hollywood. They, could not they simply could not afford to support themselves because there weren't enough acting roles to go around. There were better roles, but there weren't more roles. There were probably actually less roles. So despite the risks of provoking controversy, it was in the leading six's self-interest, in a way, to promote the civil rights movement in the hopes of applying its gains to Hollywood, applying the gains to the industry. So that brings us back to the leading six and some of the trailblazing activities of this group, some of the things that they did that really made a huge impact on the civil rights movement and would bring more and more artists into the, into the cause. Um, starting as early as 1956, they attended, headlined, and sometimes even helped organize mass rallies and demonstrations for movement organizations and causes with increasingly large crowds. Such events included a Madison Square Garden rally in 1956 in support of the Montgomery bus boycott, the 1957 prayer pilgrimage in Washington, D.C., a youth march for integrated schools in 1958. That was also in Washington, D.C. And Belafonte and Jackie Robinson were the co-organizers of that particular march. <clears throat> the other picture is of a Garment Sitter Civil Rights Rally in New York that Belafonte and Poitier headlined in 1960. And you can see 15,000 attendants. So they're, by participating in these rallies, the stars were drawing larger and larger crowds 
and also attracting newspaper headlines, and often positive newspaper headlines. The rallies themselves served as important sources of news for Northern supporters and about Southern activities and boosted the Northern network of support for Southern activists, helping, among other things, improve their morale. And we'll get to that again in a little bit. Um, another trailblazing activity that Leading Six did was to raise money. And they largely did this through benefit shows. They performed for free and often produced numerous benefit shows and concerts for movement organizations. Sammy Davis Jr. began doing such activities in 1958 at the Apollo Theater Benefit with, with Anne, Apollo Theater Benefit for the NAACP. And he would go on to become one of the movement's most successful fundraisers. He raised about $750,000 throughout um, the 1950s and 1960s. The picture up on top is him at a Detroit Freedom Fund rally, and that benefit alone raised $60,000. And he was able to make even more money after he became identified with the Rat Pack. Uh, there's Davis pictured with Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, and they became such a sort of powerful syndicate of talent in the 1960s that when they would appear at benefits, or Davis appeared alone, he was able to make even more money for or organization. And Belafonte performed in countless benefits and produced countless benefits. Um, this is from a Southern Christian Leadership Conference pamphlet about a benefit concert that he was putting on. And he recruited Miriam McCaba as well. Um, so that was a really important thing that they were doing, these benefit shows, the fundraising. The concerts had a lot of the same qualities and characteristics as a mass rally in terms of drawing crowds and drawing headlines. But they also much more explicitly raised money, and they added an air of glamour to the movement that had really not been there until that point. <clears throat> the leading six also were trailblazers by connecting movement leaders and activists to politically and culturally powerful individuals. Both Sammy Davis Jr. and Harry Belafonte campaigned for John F. Kennedy. And Belafonte was especially one to encourage Kennedy to become more familiar with movement leaders and movement goals. He encouraged Kennedy to meet with Martin Luther King Jr. And after Kennedy's victory, Belafonte worked with Kennedy's administration to facilitate voter registration voter registration projects in the Deep South. He especially worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known, better known as SNCC, to establish these voter registration groups. In the meantime, the Black Stars reached out to white celebrity friends to encourage their participation in the movement. One important example is Sammy Davis Jr. by convincing Frank Sinatra to perform in movement benefits for free and several other of their friends. So the movement organizations were then able to develop contact lists, artist contact lists, who could be easy go-tos for fundraisers and other events. Um, in terms of direct action, the most of the Stars for Freedom and most of the leading six did not engage in direct action in terms of Southern protests. Most of them were not comfortable with civil disobedience for the same reason most people aren't comfortable with civil disobedience. They, they're fear, they're fearful. They're fearful of going to jail and what could happen to them there. Um, but there were a few exceptions. Um, Charlton Heston joined in a demonstration in Oklahoma City in 1961. So that's the Upper South, which is definitely different. Um, he was inspired by his friend Jolly West there on the right, and they marched to integrate downtown Oklahoma City, especially the, the stores there. Um, but he was not arrested on that occasion, and I don't think he was ever arrested. Um, the primary exception, somebody who was willing to 
engage in civil disobedience and be arrested was the comedian Dick Gregory, pictured there on the left. He went to jail at least eight times for movement activities all over the country in places like Greenwood, Mississippi, Chicago, Illinois, Birmingham, Alabama, and Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And this oftentimes was really important to whatever project he was attempting to help by getting publicity for that project and also helping the students or the activists know that they were not isolated, that they weren't alone, that there was somebody, a name, who cared about them and might be able to get others to care about them as well. So those were the main activities of the Leading Six prior to 1963 in terms of helping develop the movement. And the movement, I think, finally caught on amongst Hollywood celebrities in the summer of 1963. And this is especially epitomized by the March on Washington. 75 Hollywood stars formed an arts group for the March on Washington in August 1963. And by doing so, they really did help build positive publicity for the march. There was a lot of publicity for the march, but a lot of it wasn't very positive. <laughs> a lot of it was um, trepidatious or fearful or downright hostile. So them being involved helped build more positive publicity. <clears throat> um, Heston and Brando were the co-organizers of the arts group coming out of Hollywood, and that's Judy Garland and Eartha Kitt. And of course, there's a lot of pictures from the March on Washington. A lot are at the National Archives, so I have quite a few to show you. Um, Ossie Davis, he basically organized the entertainment for the March on Washington. He put together a pre-march rally at the Washington Monument with a lot of folk singers and speech makers. And this helped entertain the crowds. He had singers along the way of the march. And then he helped put together the program at the Lincoln Memorial itself. So Ossie Davis was really important to building that sort of festival-like atmosphere that the March on Washington is known for. So he was a really important part. He wasn't really involved in the arts group because he lived in New York and he was on the, on the East Coast. But they sort of worked together to bring out that festival like feel. And once they were on the Lincoln Memorial, the artist provided a, a number of dramatic moments that gave good media copy. Um, there's Sammy Davis Jr. waving to the crowd. Uh, Burt Lancaster, he had been filming in Paris. He flew over from Paris and unfurled this scroll of a whole bunch of names of Americans in Europe who supported the March on Washington. This elicited a huge cheer when he did that. Um, this is a picture of Josephine Baker and Lena Horne, and Josephine Baker had basically been barred from the United States for her controversial statements. Um, she, the State Department knew that she was not a communist, but they still felt that she was controversial enough that they should just bar her. So she had not been in the United States for much of the 50s. So the March on Washington was her sort of comeback to the United States. So that seemed to provide um, a boost to the crowd. Marlon Brando was there with a, a cattle prod that he brought out of Alabama that he was you know, swinging around. So they brought a number of dramatic moments. Um, and then, of course, Martin Luther King provided the most dramatic with his I Have a Dream speech. And there's um, Paul Newman and his wife, Joanne Woodward, with A. Philip Randolph, who was sort of the brainchild of the March on Washington. So the march, in a lot of ways, was a turning point for celebrities in the civil rights movement because it paved the way for more celebrity involvement in the movement. So you just have greater numbers of celebrities willing to come out. But not only that, more celebrities willing to do things that were much more controversial than one would have thought that they would do even five years prior, largely because of the Cold War environment. So they were just engaging in many more controversial sort of activities. And you see this sort of immediate change after the March on Washington. Um, one is open organizational support. There were plenty of people in Hollywood who had been quiet supporters of the movement, but they didn't want their name affiliated 
necessarily. They didn't want it to be publicized that they'd given money, um, or they just feared the blacklist and just stayed to themselves. Uh, but that really seemed to change after the March on Washington. And a great example is this Freedom Spectacular that the NAACP put together. It was a closed circuit, a televised, closed circuit televised fundraising spectacular, basically. And they've broadcast it all over the United States to be shown in auditoriums or theaters as a way to, for local chapters to raise money. And a number of people participated in this Freedom Spectacular who had kind of stayed away before. Um, Ed Sullivan is a good example. He was a well-known liberal, but he just could shy it away from the, the civil rights movement. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, they were the hottest Hollywood couple at the time. So once they were involved, there was a lot of excitement about that. Um, Edward G. Robinson also was involved in the spectacular. And he had been on the blacklist, and he had been too scared to be involved in anything. But he came back for this. So that's why it seems like the movement, or the, the March on Washington, really provided a turning point. And this would build throughout the 1960s. A fair number of stars also would come out in support of the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s. This is a picture of Ruby Dee. She's holding a press conference in which she is defending the so-called Panther 22. They were 22 Black, Power, Black Panther Party members who'd been arrested on various charges. And she said that they were erroneous charges, that they were being sort of singled out by the police unfairly, and she was defending them. So seeing this kind of open organizational support was a really dramatic change from the 1950s. And there's also um, stars are more willing to take on some of the more controversial issues of the movement. This is a picture of Marlon Brando. He was marching in Torrance, California in 1963. It's a city outside of Los Angeles. And he was march marching for integrated housing to try to get the developer of the neighborhood to allow for integrated housing. And <clears throat> this action, it was through CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, hadn't really gotten any attention at all until Marlon Brando came. And then there were all kinds of reporters there. And the, um, the developer agreed to integrate the neighborhood. And this kind of foreshadowed um, more and more celebrity involvement in housing issues the following year. In 1964, California had a very famous Proposition 14 fight over open housing. And 150, so twice as many who, involved, who were involved in the March on Washington, 150 stars got involved in Proposition 14 to um, to openly support open housing. We also see, after the March on Washington, more and more celebrities who were willing to go south, despite the frightening hostility of Southern whites. And some stars sort of came quietly. They came to just sort of check out voter registration projects in Mississippi and Alabama, or they came to deliver money. Belafonte and Poitier went down in one harrowing trip. Uh, Marlon Brando went down just to kind of check things out. Shirley MacLaine was supposedly there stirring beans all of a sudden <laughs> in someone's house one time. So some were just sort of quietly there. Um, but in other cases, the stars helped build publicity just like they had in some of these northern rallies and marches. And this was especially showcased during the Selma to Montgomery walk in 1965. Celebrities were involved in a lot of aspects of this march. They weren't the main attraction, but they did help bring publicity and help bring the march about. Um, Dick Gregory helped launch the march from where it started in Selma. Two celebrities marched the entire way. They were the television actors, Gary Merrill, who's also famous as the ex-husband of Betty Davis and Parnell Roberts, he was from television's Bonanza. They marched the whole distance and helped with a lot of the 
the logistics along the way. There was a rally at St. Jude's right outside of Montgomery the night before sort of the final event. And there were a number of stars there, Sammy Davis Jr., Ossie Davis, Ruby D, Shelley Winters, Anthony Perkins, people who genuinely feared coming south but came anyway because they wanted to help support this particular march. And then Belafonte also led an impromptu concert from the platform of the Alabama Capitol with Joan Baez and Peter, Paul, and Mary and some other folk singers. And this provided easy filler for the news media, entertained the crowds, and really provided magnificent images of interracial unity for the newscasters. So that willingness to come south was an interesting development. And then this is a picture of Burt Lancaster at, the, at a rally at the end of the Meredith March in Mississippi. This was a march um, to encourage Mississippians to vote. There was still, despite the Voting Rights Act, there was still great fear in registering to vote. And Meredith had started this march. It was supposed to be kind of this one-man march, but he was shot on the first day. So then it turned into this much more of an extravaganza, and celebrities came down, and Burt Lancaster was one of those. And stars also, as the 60s proceeded, and especially after the, the March on Washington, were also willing, more willing to go global. They no longer, or seemed to be less fearful of an anti-communist backlash for sort of airing America's racial problems to the rest of the world. And Belafonte put on benefit shows for King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Europe. This is a headline from when they went to Sweden. And more and more stars, including Gregory and Davis and Dee, began criticizing American involvement in Vietnam, a couple of years actually before even King criticized that movement. So there's obviously sort of a change in terms of the fear about their public images and what they were willing to do. So as I was going about all of this research, uh, one of the things that I had to keep considering was how to measure the impact of these stars. In some, in some cases, it's more quantifiable than others. Uh, money was pretty quantifiable. You, know, you could find out how much was raised at a particular event, what percentage of an organization's budget that was, or where exactly the money went. So that was not as much of a challenge. Publicity was a little bit harder to quantify because you're trying to count the number of headlines, to figure out if it's negative or um, positive publicity, what, what qualities celebrities really brought to that publicity. Um, and especially with Dick Gregory, the publicity he was able to generate just seemed so important. Um, this is a headline from the New York Times. And he had gone to visit a voter registration project in Pine Bluff. And the activists there felt like they were pretty isolated. No one was really paying attention to them. Even the civil rights movement really wasn't paying attention to them in Arkansas. But he came and visited got himself arrested, went to jail, and all of a sudden, the New York Times is reporting. So the activists said that after he came, that really boosted their morale, made it much easier to recruit um, willing students and willing activists. So it really made a huge difference. It was like a turning point for them in a lot of ways. Um, so that brings us to emotional, which is the hardest to quantify, how to measure the emotional impact. But it seemed like such an important thing, um, especially from the activists I interviewed. They said that they felt that they were so isolated, especially in the Deep South. They felt like they were in so much danger. And just having even one celebrity be interested in them, they felt like that sort of provided a buffer. So it did give them this crucial uh, psychological comfort. Um, one SNCC activist, he said that 
he felt like the stars, since they all played roles for a living, that they really appreciated their real lives, the activists led, and the work they did, and that they realized that they were stars to them, you know, that the activists were stars to the stars, and that was really gratifying and important for them. Um, the fact that this is a picture of Belafonte and Poitier bailing out some jailed protesters, including John Lewis, pictured in the front, and James Foreman, both from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The fact that they would sort of personally come and bail them out of jail was also very gratifying. And also, I, you know, I found in the letters from the period, a lot of emotional letters written from civil rights organizations to those celebrities who had supported them. And one really touching example was between James Foreman of SNCC who wrote to Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory had personally delivered 14,000 pounds of food to Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, this was in reaction to a number of Southern blacks, who locals, who had sort of seemed interested in what the SNCC activists were doing, who had expressed an interest in registering to vote, found that they would be fired or they'd be pushed off their land as sharecroppers and were suffering economically. And then at the same time, in Greenwood, Mississippi, and some of the surrounding counties, they cut the food relief rolls. So there was literally a famine about to begin in Greenwood, Mississippi. And Gregory helped raise the money. He helped bring the food down, because um, he, he basically had to hand deliver it to them. Before, otherwise, it would be interfered with by local authorities. And James Foreman wrote him a letter after all this. And he said, the thousands of hungry Negroes in Lafleur, Sunflower, and Coahoma counties know perhaps for the first time in their lives that they are not friendless, and they do not have to be afraid to try to get their rights. The number of field workers has increased from 30 to 42. Again, thanks to you. I hate to sound maudlin, but your efforts have really increased our determination to stay in Mississippi and get the job done. So seeing those kinds of statements helps provide that sort of psychological measure that I think is really important to these celebrities being involved. Um, and you can also measure impact by their impact on Hollywood itself, sort of coming back to Hollywood. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act allowed movement gains to be applied to Hollywood in employment, and especially in winning more jobs behind the scenes. A number, the leading six and a number of the Stars for Freedom also became uh, filmmakers, they became screenwriters, producers, and directors, and that held so much more of a position of authority where they could insist on improved roles and more employment opportunities for African Americans in the film industry. This is a film poster from the, the movie Buck and the Preacher. It was a Western that Belafonte and Poitier co-produced and a couple days into the filming, they decided to fire the director and Poitier. This was the first film that Poitier directed. So they were able to control the message of the film, which was really about black aspirations after the Civil War, and also able to control the casting and the hiring and all those sorts of things. <clears throat> and this paved the way for Poitier to be a very successful director in the 1970s. And he, uh, in 1980, he directed the film Stir Crazy, which was the highest grossing film of a black director ever until that, until that point. And now, African Americans work in every phase of the film and television industries. And usually, this year is a big exception, usually there are multiple black contenders for Academy Awards. So their impact on Hollywood itself, I think, was also very influential. But more broadly, the Stars for Freedom also helped pave the way for more celebrity involvement in politics, especially social movements once deemed too controversial. And this can be seen with such causes as the anti-Vietnam War movement, the American Indian movement, and the gun movement in the 1970s and 80s, as well as in the current political environment. And they really show how, how celebrities can effectively raise funds 
publicity, and psychological support for political causes in the media age. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you would like to ask a question, I've been told to send you to either of these microphones. Hello. Hi. So Hollywood is in California, and California has a lot of racial problems, uh -huh. not just black and white, but obviously the Hispanic issues in uh -huh. the 50s, Japanese, Chinese, whatever. Did the Hollywood involvement in the civil rights struggle extend to other races, or did it was it strictly white African Americans? Did they also promote Hispanics? Did they promote Chinese? Mm -hmm. Did they promote Japanese? Mm -hmm. Um, mostly during this period, it extended to Native Americans, especially through the work of Marlon Brando and Dick Gregory. They didn't dramatically take on these other um, ethnic civil rights groups, sort of maybe smallly, like their own personal efforts in terms of casting approval and that sort of thing. But it, it did seem to be focused mostly on African Americans and Native Americans during this period. Yes. Uh, yes, greetings, Ms. Raymond. I'm uh, Demetrius Dillard with the Washington Afro-American. Um, I was just curious to know um, what message did you intend to send to the, the younger audience um, through your book? Okay, the message to a younger audience. Yeah, what, what, what was your main, or the message or theme that you wanted to communicate to the younger, or just overall to your audience uh -huh. uh, in the book that you wrote? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is that celebrities are often accused of being really self-involved or hypocritical or contributing negatively to the political environment. Um, but with this group, the Stars for Freedom and particularly the Leading Six, we can see that that's completely the opposite, that they provide something really constructive and meaningful and important. And the media has changed to some degree in terms of social media, of course. But they found ways to use the media for the movement's gain. And I think um, current stars should be reached out to, and they should be encouraged to support social movements as well. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, I'm curious about I think one of the untold stories of the civil rights movement is the funding for the movement and the uh -huh. role celebrities played. In your research, how difficult was it to find these kind of financial records and, um, and, and these stories? How, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things I was, you know, anytime you look at a, a finding aid, anytime it would say fundraising, I'd be like, yes, or budgets, yes, because that would help me figure that out. So. Some of the records aren't that clear, and some of them are contradictory, but all of the civil rights organizations kept financial records. And all of the SNCC papers are on microfilm, or a lot of the SNCC papers are on microfilm in terms of organizational records. And then a number of the activists have been donating their papers pretty regularly. So if they were involved in fundraising, I could get information from them. James Foreman, in particular, his papers are at the Library of Congress. And he was really organized and saved everything. So I had a lot of information from him. And he was the one who was connecting with celebrities the most out of SNCC. So his, his papers were great. And they just appeared at the Library of Congress like a year and a half ago. So it was so exciting for me that they <laughs> were open and available. But yeah, most of them kept records. You know, I could, it would be difficult to just you know, find a folder on celebrity fundraising. Necessary. You have to like comb through it all. But the NAACP, all of their papers are at the Library of Congress. So that would, the only kind of difficult um, organization I had was the SCLC because those papers are scattered around. Um, there's the King Center in Stanford. The King's papers are in Boston. And then the SCLC in Atlanta, that King Center was having some organizational problems. So I had the hardest time 
with them. But at the same time, Taylor Branch has written these three really detailed books about King, so I could get a lot of information from that, too. Yes. Uh, one brief comment on the previous question, which was that the ho members of Hollywood did try to deal with some of the problems that Japanese Americans had okay. in the 50s. Okay. <clears throat> that was not really civil rights, but the movie Bad Day at Black Rock with Spencer Tracy is a good example Ooh. of uh, some dealing with some of those issues um, with an amazing cast, Lee Marvin and a whole bunch of people. Uh, James Coburn. But the other thought, the question I had was... Um, Thank you. <clears throat> the question I had was about uh, the FBI, and did they investigate any of these six actors, and was there any knowledge about whether J. Edgar Hoover had spies out for them? I know he was wiretapping King, but I'm wondering yes. if any of the Hollywood actors were wiretapped. Yes, there is an FBI file on Sammy Davis Jr. So I got some pretty good information out of that, actually. And um, Harry Belafonte was, I didn't have a specific file on him, but he showed up a lot in the FBI files because of King being wiretapped and several of King's aides being wiretapped who Belafonte was close to. Um, but the rest I did not have FBI files for, and I don't know if that means they don't exist or <laughs> if I just didn't find them, but um, those were the, Belafonte and, well, in Malcolm X, there's an FBI file on Malcolm X, and Dick Gregory and Ossie Davis uh, worked closely with him during certain periods, and so I found out a little information about them through his, his file. Oh, did she? Uh, huh. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Yes. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned uh, SNCC reaching out to, uh, form, reaching out to um, Hollywood in terms of using them uh, for media publicity. Uh -huh. And you also talked about the House of an American um, Activity Committee. Mm -hmm. M my question is um, maybe which came first, the chicken or the egg? Do you think that the, uh, perhaps the Hollywood came to the civil rights movement or did the civil rights movement go to Hollywood? Um, for that activism, which do you think mm -hmm. came first? Well, I think it's more Hollywood came to the civil rights movement, but mostly because Davis, Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee, Poite and Belafonte were involved with the movement before they went to Hollywood. So they were involved in the late 40s and early 50s, but Poitier's big break was like 1950. And even though it was a big break, I mean, <laughs> looking back, we can call it a big break. He still really struggled throughout the, the first half of the 1950s in terms of film roles. Um, and Belafonte's first big film wasn't until 1956. So yeah, I think it's more Hollywood came to them. But they weren't established like A-list Hollywood stars at that time either. That, that's not till more like the early 1960s. Does that make sense? OK. <laughs> Any other? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi. Did you get into the idea that uh, foreign, another pressure on Hollywood was the fact that foreign films were much more of a new thing in America in the early 60s, and in particular, the franker depiction of relationships between the races. I'm thinking of British pictures like uh, Georgie Girl and A Taste of Honey. Do you think that was in the Hollywood equation at all? It's not that far between uh, A Taste of Honey and uh, Lilies of the Field, for example. Uh -huh. Right. Um, I don't know. I didn't really come across that necessarily. But at the same time, I know that um, the film studios in the, in the early 50s, they started doing market research. And they realized that there was a, I'm surprised they didn't really do market research until then, but they did realize that there was an audience for more mature films that in these art house, these foreign films sort of reflected. So part of that independent picture trend was probably intersected with that. But that's the best I can do there. <laughs> yes. So on the... Uh cover of your book, you have, and we saw in the clip, Charlton Heston, and you 
apparently did also did a book on him. Yes. So what happened? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. It seems like he had some sort of reverse epiphany or <laughs> I know, I get that question about <laughs> Charlton Heston and Bill Cosby both. What happened to Bill Cosby? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Heston, yeah, he, and the way he thought of it was that he had always been a champion of civil liberties. So his championing of the civil rights movement was one for civil liberties in the same way with guns. And he also always said that it was the Democratic Party that had changed, that it wasn't really him who had changed. And he had always been, he was like a, a conservative Cold War Democrat, even when he was aligned with the Democrats. Um, but once he became involved with the NRA, it does seem like his, his public persona changed somewhat, and that he, especially when you're with a lobbying group, a single issue lobbying group, you're more militant, you're less prone to compromise, and some of the things that had uh, been really beneficial to him as the Screen Actors Guild president and this arts group leader and so forth. But um, I mean, he did, he supported the civil rights movement and his, his films in the 1970s. He exercised a lot of casting authority. So he made sure there were interracial friendships and interracial romances in his films like um, Soylent Green or Planet of the Apes um, and those sorts of things. But he, he was also conservative when it came to the movement itself. You know, he was uncomfortable with civil disobedience. He, wouldn't, he was not going to go get involved in any kind of civil disobedience. So he didn't go from like some raging radical on the left to a raging radical on the right. You know, there, he was moderate in his support of the civil rights movement, I think. Thank okay. You so much. Thank you.